Thank you for taking the time to check out the Insight Myanmar podcast. If you like what you're hearing, we would be ever so grateful if you would consider rating, reviewing, and or sharing this podcast. As we are just starting out, every little bit of feedback helps. Also make sure to subscribe to the Insight Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. If you cannot find our feed on your podcast player, please let us know and we will ensure that it can be offered there. So this is a new thing that we're trying out. Um, there's so much variety to be found in the, the practice and the Dhamma life here in Myanmar that we're also experimenting with different ways to be able to express that and share that. Up till now, we've just done a lot of more formal or even informal interviews. But this is a new idea where with the, the background of experience that both you, Zach, and I have in Myanmar, we have these stories and anecdotes uh, that have happened to us or happened to people we know of inspiration, information of things that have taken place in our Dhamma practice in this country. And there, some of these stories are so involved and layered that we're not able to express them even when they relate to one of the stories of the guests. And so we had this idea to do these kind of Dhamma diaries, these Myanmar Dhamma diaries where we get to share these stories. So this is our first experiment with that. Yeah, just so listeners know, I'm here too to uh, to listen along with you, but also to um, to uh, ask questions along the way, or and to just dis- discuss it afterwards. So, and then there'll be times when I'm sharing stories as well. So, yeah, let's give it a try, huh? Yeah, right, right. So this uh, this episode, I'll be sharing a story that happened to me a few years ago, and we'll be talking about that and fleshing it out, processing it, unpacking it, looking at more of the detail and the Burma Dhamma context. And then next episode, you have a story ready to unpack yourself. That's uh, that, that that's quite a thing when we get there. Um, but first, we'll uh, we'll talk about something that happened to me uh, a few years ago. Yeah, please do tell. Yeah, right. So Zach, you were actually involved and in, heavily involved in one part of in one section of the story, one day of the story. Um, and you you know some of the details, maybe not all the details as we go. So to build the scene, this was, oh, you know, three years ago, maybe. And uh, at this time, uh, my wife and I were living in Yangon and we were doing Airbnb. Um, Yangon real estate is uh, quite expensive, uh, counterintuitively. Most most people wouldn't think that, but it's um, prices have gone down a little bit, but it's been um, quite pricey. And so we were we were making ends meet by having by renting out one of the the rooms. And all in all, it was a really fantastic experience. You know, we had uh, you you're able to describe yourself and also describe the the rules for the room. And so, you know, we described ourselves as meditative practitioners, as some of the work I was doing with the meditator's guide and the, um, um, at that time, the pilgrimage. And, uh, we asked that any visitors that came would follow the five precepts, mainly just no intoxicants. We didn't want to live in a, in a room with intoxicants. And we had some, some pretty interesting and inspiring people who came that some tourists who were coming to Myanmar largely because of, um, of, uh, of the practice and other people that were just somewhat interested in it. But most people self-selected to stay with us who knew what we were about and knew what the rules were. A couple guests, we, we had some pretty interesting stories as well, actually. They might um, necessitate other, other uh, installments of this podcast series, but none of the stories could hold a candle to 
the wildness and the unexpected nature of one person who stayed with us. And that's going to be the subject of, um, of the story that follows. Um, so we had a request from a European businessman who was um, residing in Southeast Asia and had some business in, in Myanmar to stay with us. And we, uh, he was going to stay a week. And so we, um, we had accepted the invitation and he, he came, um, he came in the morning to introduce himself and to drop some things off. And, um, it seemed like a nice guy and it was, um, it was nothing really special about that interaction. And then that afternoon I had a knock on the door. I think it was evening. It was just, the sun was setting. I remember. And, um, and the the doorman of the the flat we were living in, the kind of the, the guard who just sits outside all day chewing beetle and um, gossiping with his friends, drinking tea, he was kind of urgently motioning that I should follow him downstairs and was kind of like trying to wave him off. You know, I don't have any business downstairs. I, I, I don't know what it is you want to bring me to. And he was very insistently. <laughs> so I came down. <laughs> And I see our Airbnb guest. This is his, his first evening of staying with us. I see him standing outside of a taxi, soaking head to foot. I mean, it looked like he had just stepped out of a pool. I don't even know how he was able to be that wet in the situation that he was in. <laughs> and he's barely able to stand. And he's yelling at the taxi driver, refusing to pay him and accusing him of something. Um, these kinds of scenes are not very popular in Myanmar. So this is really standing out. <laughs> um, mostly it seems you don't have these kind of foreigner local interactions that are going south very quickly. Like you're, you're seeing here. Well, you know, not showing anger is, it's a sign of, especially in the Dhamma uh, community or a culture that, you know, you're, you're out of control, you know, and you're expressing these, uh, dosa essentially, uh, it's uh, I mean, of course it happens because we're humans, but it, it's kind of not done. And then and then so these kind of very outrageous because of that's the kind of the norm, then these outrageous events stand out all the more. So just wanted to put that into it's a little different than, you know, if you were somewhere in Europe or in in in, in North America, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's a good point. And that leads to another discussion that isn't, don't have time in this place in context that because you're not allowed in this culture to have overt expressions of anger, it, when it's not handled properly, it can be suppressed and come out in, in other forms. Um, but in any case, this is not something that you, you really see very often. Um, he was, um, I, I, I hadn't gotten through the full description of, of the scene. I had left off with him soaking wet from head to foot, yelling at the taxi driver and barely able to stand because of absolute intoxication. I mean, just absolutely um, trashed, you know, not really looking in his eyes. He didn't really seem to have any idea where he was. It had been a long time since I had seen someone in this state of inebriation. And I'm to bring this drunk, outrageous, wet foreigner to my Airbnb. Another thing to give you context of is that reputation is really important in Myanmar. It is a small country. Um, everyone knows everyone. Um, if you, if you don't know everyone, you know, someone else, you, you know, someone who knows someone, um, it's grown. The expat community has grown a little bit. You know, I've been here about 10 years and 10 years ago, it was tiny. Um, there are so many stories to tell about the tiniest at, at that time and the importance of reputation. The, the one that I just love that really uh, illustrates just how intimate everything was is uh, one of my closest friends who was my work colleague, like me, wore a lungi, um, you know, the um, kind of uh, sarong type, uh, fabric that many of the men wear. And one time he was in the Bangkok airport on a visa run, just wearing normal clothes. And a Burmese walked up to him and said, Hey, aren't you that foreigner who wears the lungji around Yangon? So, you know, that's a sign of the intimacy and knowledge that people have of each other here. Um, but in, in any case, in, in our story, you know, 
this is really embarrassing because we're, we obviously we're, we're, we're following a good ethical life and we're, we're not making waves. And then we have this outrageous foreigner just screaming at people on the street and absolutely slosh. So that itself is kind of concerning and not really great for our future of staying in this apartment. So anyway, we bring him upstairs barely. I mean, he's, he's barely able to stand. He kind of falls into the, the living room, um, makes um some kind of leers at my wife and you know scares her and then barely manages to get to his room and i i literally mean barry i literally mean barely because as he walked through the threshold of his room he stepped in the garbage can fell down and just barely landed with his chest and face onto the bed and passed out there with his, um, you know, clothes still on and one foot still in the garbage can. So that was our, (laughs) our first night of the Airbnb guest. (laughs) I was going to ask if his foot was still in the trash can. It was. And we have a picture of that. I mean, I took a picture partly just to, to know that I was going to contact Airbnb and to, to show him, you know, to, to, to show what we were dealing with. And, um, you know, we shut the door of the room. I, I came back later and, and checked, uh, a couple hours and he was still, you know, half on the bed with his foot still in the trash can. Um, we didn't know what to do. Um, the next day, uh, we had a scheduled guest from one of our good Dhamma friends, uh, Uaga, who's a, a Dutch monk. Um, he was coming to see us and, when he you know, it's coming to for a conversation, we we're going to serve him, a, offer him a lunch. And when he came, we, I think this guest was, was not there. He's in his room where he was out and we had told what happened and he was, um, you know, he was quite alarmed as well by it. And, and also just kind of reference to Uaga, you know, it's, what's really strange about this is that we have the set of rules and description about ourselves that usually people self-select not to stay here. And yet he really tried to stay with us. And I just don't get why someone from that lifestyle would want to stay with people that were doing something so different. You know, it's very strange. So eventually he came in and Uaga talked to him. I must've been preparing the food or cleaning or something. And uh, it, it was very different Uaga talking to him than me for two reasons. One is that he was a monastic and so he was somewhat removed from society so it allowed for a level of directness and you know admonishment to to be frank and two he wasn't in any way connected to the business of him staying so he could also confront him in ways that we were not necessarily comfortable um given some of the other factors with his stay there uh and in the course of the conversation uaga found out that he had actually he it was not accidentally or um or without regard that he had chosen to stay at our airbnb he indicated to uaga that he felt like he was on his last legs that he felt like he had lost his handle on life and that um these good people who are into buddhist meditation um and spirituality might have something to offer um to offer him at that point Hmm. and when and Uaga also was not shy in confronting him and was very clear that, you know, first of all, this level of intoxication was not great, that any level of intoxication did not go with spirituality and that he was violating the rules of the Airbnb stay. Um, so he did confront him on that level and he seemed, um, the guest seemed, uh, you know, a little bit shameful and, and sorry about that. Um so Uaga reported the conversation to me after it happened, and this really changed the way that my wife and I came to see this interaction. And um, and it went from, and I, I should preface too, I, sometime this day, I think it was before Uaga arrived, we called Airbnb, we complained about the situation. They were very sympathetic. They couldn't do much from their end, but they 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 said that they, you know, we shouldn't have to put up with this behavior and that um, he had also broken the code of, of, of staying there so that they could help us in any way that we, we wanted. So we were, we were really looking at taking action to um, have him removed as soon as possible, just given the danger to, um, well, to everything really. Um, and um, we just didn't really want to associate with someone like that and to house someone like that in our, in our space. Sure. Um, after hearing 
Uaga's uh, description of what he said, our hearts softened a little, and we realized that as hard as it was, we were we were actually somewhat in a position to to help. I don't know how we were going to help, but we we realized that that this was someone kind of on his last stages, and it was a plea for help, and and that we were the recipients, and so this led us to a pause and we also appreciated that Uaga had had confronted him and not drinking and at least if he doesn't drink that's something we can manage and but he was still in pretty deep denial of of his state he he described his intoxication the other night as a couple drinks and wasn't or couldn't recognize the state of his intoxication and so when i realized that this guest was not facing reality that he had to face, um, at minimum kind of what actually happened in my mind, one of the, the next steps that I thought was to call you Zach, who at that time was a foot, was a, was a monk, a forest monk. I was about to say you, um, um, you, you did spend a lot of time in the forest at this time you were in Yangon, you were at the Shui Min center, a couple hours North of Yangon. And with your background, in meditation and yet also in confrontation of, um, and having difficult conversations in your, your, your past work environment that I thought to call you and to, to ask if you would come. And in just a moment, I, I, I want to check in with you about your experience and your memory of it. I want to set it up a little bit more to the time that you got there. So we hear a little bit more of the background and then kind of hear what happened when you came on the scene from your own mouth. Um, but, um, I I can't remember exactly the sequence, but I think I first called you and I remember laughing uh, and saying, you know, I'm calling this monk who's devoting his life to, you know, practice and study in quiet areas and, um, you know, just just kind of a simple ritual throughout the day. And I'm asking him to sit through, you know, three or four hours of terrible Yangon traffic that makes people nauseous and come and confront a complete stranger that he's never met and might never meet again and might not be open to the difficult communication and help him to in that day of talking to um to have some degree of acceptance of his condition and and some exploration of how buddhist meditation could start to help him um that probably wasn't exactly what i pitched to you but that was that was kind of what i was laughing <laughs> with like boy this is really an act of service if if, if he accepts if you accept and I, I you know i think i i told you i updated you up to that point of of who had come and how he had acted and what you know what had transpired and uh and asked about your willingness to to come and you said you were and then i went to the guest and i i i said you know you say you're interested in meditation i know this american monk who is willing to come here and talk to you and he could talk to you about meditation and, um, um, and you can ask him questions and, you know, it's kind of a special chance to explore while you're in Myanmar. I, I wanted him to have some, some buy-in. And so I did say, you know, for him, for, for, for my friend to come, you, because he's a monk, he doesn't have anything. You have to pay for his taxi there and back. And you also have to pay for, you have to offer him a lunch that you pay for. I felt it was really important for him to have a buy-in that this was his thing that he was doing. And he agreed to that. So we got back to you and a taxi was sent and you came for what amounted to, gosh, you know, eight, nine hours of one-on-one intense conversation. And with that, before I share my background views of that, I, I, I think it's uh, adequate to turn it over to you and get your perspective on this moment. Yeah, so just a tiny bit of background. Uh, I have a background in psychology and, and therapy, uh, working with uh, people that have trouble um, struggling with uh, perhaps addiction, anger, depression, uh, so so anyways this was compl- and, and the substance abuse as well so this was this was actually totally in my wheelhouse uh, but you know as a monk you know I wasn't there to actually do you know to to uh, you know uh, do therapy with someone it was to more of a dhamma perspective and and uh, one of the foundations of dhamma is sila so uh, the angle I took I remember was uh, about being honest first but about the truth you know about what was really going on you know that he and that he hadn't been and and uh joa was there uh at least uh most of the time a lot of the time and not all the time but and we could we could compare the stories that 
what happened uh, versus what he was saying happened and how there, you know, that, like if I did get that he had some buy into wanting to try to meditate, uh, to learn meditation and to, to turn his life around. I said, well, if you want to turn your life around, you have to be honest about where you are. Because if you're going to, if you don't know where you are, you won't know how much to turn. So if you're leaving a bunch of stuff off, then then you won't turn around from that stuff. So we have to get, let's get it all on the table. And let's get really honest about what happened here since you've been at Joe's house. Um, and it took a while. but and, and he was afraid, you know, of course, you know. To, to see it all himself and then to share that with people but try to create a safe environment for him to do that um, try to establish some quick rapport and you know and and I think we got there you know and so uh, that's what I remember anyways that uh, you know there was denial and then and so it isn't just forcing the truth it's when the denial comes you to look right at that like right here like this is where it's manifesting right now and we can do something different right now um, and give them other options and uh, and and show its role in the overall bigger picture. So um, yeah, and and the obligation of contract in his word, you know, that was all part of it as well. That you know he was actually in violation of of something, an agreement he had made. And so there was showing him some of his own tricks as well, like the minimization and denial. Those are tricks we play on our own mind so that we can be okay with ourselves. Uh, it's common. So, yeah, just working through all these kind of uh, ways to dodge full responsibility, you know. Like sometimes people take partial responsibility and that, you know, a lot of people will just let that go at that. You know, like, no, we let's get let's get real. Let's get it all out on the table. So that took a while. And the people I was working with, I was usually working with over months, not just a day. So... So, you know, just trying to build on what he gets and then, you know, he's going to draw back on that and then and then you just walk him through it again. And, and, and you know, you don't really move forward until you're, you're clear, like, with the truth. And, uh, you know, he, ultimately he did. The, I mean, the, it's not like the loops ever ended unsuccessfully. In the end, you know, he was, he was much more honest, you know. Uh, it took... That's a type of sobering that's more emotional. It's not just sobering from the alcohol. It's sobering from all the um, defenses and mechanisms of protection that you have uh, around it. Yeah, that's a good point. And to so to add on to the story, you know, as the day was progressing and you were going through, you know, on one hand, you were providing information about meditative possibilities. And on the other hand, you were also confronting him about um, what he wasn't accepting. And as the day started to progress, we started to realize, okay, well, what, where is this going to go? You know, what, um, um, in the shape that he's in, where can he get relief or experience? And we kind of went through the, you know, we're in the land of Dhamma, we're in Burma. I've, I've written and you've helped with a meditator's guide. So if there's anyone that is going to know something of the country and the opportunities open, you know, this is a, you, know, you and I are a pretty good pair to be able to figure these things out. And we're just going through this list of possibilities and we're, you know, we're looking at this monastery or this meditation center, or this, um, this place and, um, nothing is quite, is kind of sinking in right away. Just given his, uh, the intensity of a situation, you know, that he's, that, he's coming from from such this danger of um uh, of uh inebriation to the point of memory loss and suddenly the idea comes to us uh Injinbin you know Webu Sayada's monastery in Injinbin um Webu Sayada was one of the most famous 20th century Burmese monks many considered him an arhat or fully enlightened um, he was also instrumental in encouraging Siyaji Ubekan to teach at International Meditation Center, who, of course, was the um, the teacher of SN Goenka. The Vipassana that spread around the world is largely a credit to Webu's encouragement of uh, Ubekan to teach. It's a this is a monastery we've spent uh, a lot of time in, a lot of time researching. 
uh, in the guidebook, I think there's some, you know, 40, 50 pages just on this side alone. And we know the, the, the not the Sayada, but he's um, kind of second in command there, uh, Umandala, Ashin Mandala. We know him quite well. And uh, Umandala is really res- responsible, just to give some background on this place, Umandala is quite responsible for the opening of Injin Bin itself. You know, it was a place that after Webu passed away in 1977, was really quite lost to history and um, the memory of what happened there. And, uh, you know, one of the things we did in the guidebook was trace back the first meditators in the Goenka tradition who found this place and then told their friends about it, who told their friends, and then it expanded into something of a pilgrimage site. And uh, Webu Seida himself actually predicted that one day um, busloads of foreigners would come to pay respects. They would come in double-decker buses, he said. Hotels would be built. He was very specific about this uh, this prophecy. Uh, and, uh, and so it has this really curious history, both in terms of the, the land itself, the, the this famous monk who was there. And we should mention this is a village in Upper Burma, and this is really a village. I mean, this is, you know, four or five hours from Mandalay. And we're in Yangon, and this, this is, you have to get to Mandalay first. And then in four or five hours, the last hour is on a very rough road that, um, you know, bumps you up for, um, um, if you're, if you're in, some of those old cars back in the day that didn't have shocks, it would, uh, you know, your head would be hitting the ceiling every five seconds because it'd be the jets on the road would be bumping you up and up and up. So it's really far out there. And we thought, you know, this, this place has kind of two things going for it. One is it's, um, it's something of an Island. Uh, it's a village with nothing around. I mean, there's nothing around it. There's no places of business even, even it's just the monastery and the village and nothing else. Uh, that's one reason. And reason number two is that Umandala is, uh, is self-taught in English and very interested in foreigners and, and wanting to help um, foreign practitioners. And just a very kind, compassionate, considerate man that might might be willing to take him on. Um, so we start to think, like, this could be a place. Like, this could be, this is a strategy developing. This could be a place where he goes. And um, and so throughout that day, while he was still there, I thought to call Umandala and, you know, he, fortunately he was there, he answered the phone. And so funny thing here again is that, uh, you know, just as I called you, Zach, uh, the day before and asked you to interrupt your peaceful routine to come and talk to someone you don't know in a very difficult conversation, I'm now calling Umandala and I'm asking him if he wouldn't mind accepting someone in the throes of inebriation with no meditative experience who I can't vouch for, um, I don't have any past relationship with and, uh, is a foreigner so that if he acts out could cause, um, some kind of risk or jeopardy to the monastery itself. And I'm just asking if he would mind taking a person like this under his wing to, to help him out. Um, I should also give some backstory that I've introduced many meditators to Umandala who've wanted to go to uh, his monastery to pay respects to Webu Sayada and to practice seriously. And, you know, so in up until this time, every every person, every foreigner I've introduced him to are foreigners with years of meditative experience who, you know, Sheila is the backbone of their life. Um, they wouldn't come near intoxication. They give Donna donation after they leave out of gratitude. They behave with the utmost politeness and sincerity, and they they understand a lot of uh, the principles of Buddhism and meditation. Um, and now I'm suggesting to bring some there who has, someone there who has none of that and who I can't even vouch for. Um, and I was very upfront about this on the phone with Umandala. I was not pushing him to take this person on or, um, trying to talk him into it. I, I, I knew that this was, um, this was a very unique situation. I told him, um, in a lot of detail about how he had acted out and our concerns with him and how he did feel that this was his, he was on his last legs and he, uh, he had come to us and we we're trying to think of, of a place for him to go. And, um, and that it wasn't someone who had a background of alcoholism. It was someone that literally day to day and hour to hour was not able to stop drinking. And I was really open to Mandela's answer, whatever it would be. I was very open to, to Mandela just saying, you know, this is a bit too much for us and, um, and totally accepting that. And, uh, and instead Umandala responded, um, in the conversation, we're having a casual conversation and I'll never forget steel just appeared in his voice, just absolute steel. And, 
absolute concentration and focus. And I still remember what he said to me. He said, Joa, this is not a bad person. He does not have a bad heart. This is someone with clouds obstructing his heart. And we need to scatter those clouds to have his brightness shine again. Just this this power of poetic language, like I've never heard Umandala speak before or since. Um, yeah, that touched me even as you said it. Like I started to get mm. even a little choked up because I do remember, I, I remember that this person, he was a good person and he's struggling. And, and this is what, this is what the Dhamma is. Uh, life is difficult and we find all kinds of ways to relieve ourselves and some of them aren't healthy. And this guy was just stuck in it and he was, you know, he was mm. actually asking for help. So that's such a beautiful sentiment as you expressed that steel determination to help this person clear his clouds so he could shine through. That was really, a, yeah. Was yeah. 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 It was, it was incredibly touching to hear from Amandala, especially when I really left him every option open to not take on what amounted to a really major risk and something the likes of which he'd never experienced before. You know, who, who knows what he's dealt with with Burmese villagers, but for a uh, European cosmopolitan businessman with his own struggles, um, this, this was new territory for him. Uh, so to finish what he said, you know, after saying that in the same voice of steel, he said, Joa, I will take responsibility for him. I will bring him here. He will stay. The only thing he has to agree is that he will not touch alcohol and he'll stay in my village for, he set a time limit on, and I don't know if it was 14 days or 20 days, um, some extended period. He said, you know, more than a week for sure. He said, um, he said, I will, I will take him on. You send him to me. And I, again, repeated my caveat and my disclaimer. I wanted to make sure there was no misunderstanding. And he kind of shushed me and said, no, no, no. I'm. I, I will take him on. It was really someone rising to the challenge of um, uh, of accepting that that there was a person in need that he could play a role in. And so then we went back to him with this information, and then we had to get him on board with going. Not that we wanted, you know, we wanted it to be his decision. We didn't want to push him into it, but we also wanted him to know the the opportunities that were now apparent and that, that what he had come to do, there was now someone willing to take him on. And, um, and I remember you played an instrumental role in kind of explaining to him who Mandela, who Mandela was and, and where he could go in practice and, um, and helping him to see that possibility. I don't know if you remember much of that conversation in the afternoon. Well, yeah, that's more vague. I just remember, you know, I mean, we both just thought that, Umandala's uh, disposition as a person would be, just be such a nice fit. You know, if if we had sent him to a meditation center, for example, that was more kind of just structured and stuff, you know, I mean, he might get lucky there too and have someone take us under his wing. But, but because he could be disruptive, maybe they would just kick him out. Maybe it would be actually could be quite a bad experience if he went to the wrong place. Was, but so in, way in this village, you know, and, and there's no other thing, you know, he's not really going to be, be disruptive even if he struggled, you know, and uh, uh, it just seemed like such a good fit. And uh, I mean, the other last piece of the puzzle to come in is whether whether this person would um, would want to go. And uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, he asked questions and tried to get a feel for it. But I think uh, if I remember quite correctly he he did get quite on board with the idea right yeah he did he did he there as i remember there was still kind of that loop mentality where he was he would kind of get on board but then he'd roam off into something that we'd have to bring him on track again and i remember as the conversation was going on i think i pulled you aside or maybe i talked to you later i don't remember but i suddenly had a fear that his sobriety was so um fragile that I, you know, we were talking about sending him on a bus. We talked about a bus or a plane. He wanted a bus. And so we were saying, you know, well, if we send him on a bus from Yangon to Mandalay, and then normally when meditators go, they, from Mandalay, they take up another bus to, to, to one of, to, to a nearby town of Injinbin. And the, there's no buses that actually go to Injinbin. It's such a small village. And the new Mandala comes out and meets them. But I didn't think he could stay sober. I thought that if he got off the Mandalay bus station, that we might never hear from him again. Um, that was how fragile his sobriety was. And so 
I contacted Amandala and I, I told him this again. I said, look, I'm, I'm sorry to, to dump more kind of bad news onto this, but I don't know if he could actually get on his own. I think that that he'll fall off the wagon, you know? And, um, and so Mandela said, I'll, you know, I'll have my supporters and myself will come to the Mandalay bus station to meet him. He totally understood the problem and the situation. He said, we'll just meet him at the Mandalay bus station. You know, we'll meet him. We'll come down five hours and we'll meet him there. And then we'll take him back to the monastery. And so then we went back to the guest and we told him this, you know, we told him, um, just the level of, of service and, and care that, was being offered to him, um, to, to help him. And, and eventually he was on board. The, the funny part of this was that, you know, we, I think on all our side, you know, you and me and my wife, Uaga, Mandela, we all saw the, the severity that he was in and just felt like he, he needs to go there immediately. He needs to go there now. Well, he had five days left on his Airbnb, um, reservation and he didn't want to lose the money from that. Um, I mean, of course we could have worked something out, but he just was like, you know, well, I have five more days. I'll stay five more days and go. And nothing could really talk him out of that. We, those five days were pins and needles. I mean, just pins and needles. And I remember you laid down the law to him before you left of, you know, really no drinking, no intoxication. You're following these rules. Like, you know, everyone's doing all this for you. You have to follow your end of it. And he's, you know, of course he's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 And, you know, we, we, it's it's hard to believe any word at this point. And, um, you know, those five days were just were pins and needles of, of like, what is going to happen next, you know, really, you know, scared for him and scared for ourselves. And I think there was a couple times I saw him that he seemed not quite right. Could have been, you know, the residue or could have been that he had, he was, he had, taken something in and then stopped himself. But in any case, there weren't any episodes. And, um, we got a trusted taxi driver to take him to the Yangon bus station. We're kind of thinking of every place that he could fall down along the way. And, um, <laughs> and so right. we, we got him from the, um, you know, our, a, a, a taxi driver took him from our home to the bus station, telling him really like, you know, don't let him out of your sight, make sure he gets on the bus. And then the Yangon bus station to Mandalay, just hoping that, you know, he doesn't get off the bus somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Cause there's not much between the Yangon Mandalay road. Um, and, uh, and, you know, hoping new Mandela picks him up and, uh, and then he gets there. And so all that, all that happens. I mean, just short, long story short, you know, those five days, his trip to Injin Bin, all that happens. And then he's at Injin Bin and he's in Umandala's care and he stayed for, you know, a couple of weeks, whatever it was. I don't quite remember. Um, I heard pieces of the story from him, um, later on from Umandala, from his Facebook feed that I, I saw wonderful pictures and, um, piecing that together, uh, you know, Umandala had him waking up at uh, four o'clock every morning. That's, you know, Burmese monastic life starts very early. Meditation center life starts early. He had him waking up at four in the morning. Right. And his job for the first several days was only sweeping. Very fitting for a Webu Sayada monastery. Anyone who knows about Webu Sayada has seen pictures of him holding a broom, has heard stories about him, you know, this, this, um, one of the most famous monks figures of Burma at the time. And he's sweeping his own walkways. Um, you know, he, uh, uh, he doing the work himself. Um, he was, uh, he was a very industrious person, not just in meditation, but in, um, building roads and pagodas and buildings and, and sweeping. And so here at the Webu Stayada Monastery, he has the, this guy waking up four o'clock in the morning and just sweeping nothing else, nothing else. Um, you know, you'd expect that they're probably having some level of conversation. Um, I know they ate together every day. And then after a few days of sweeping, he just kind of starts to talk to him about following the breath. And, you know, we should note again at a Webu Sayada monastery, uh, Webu Sayada himself, the one thing he taught was Anapana. It was in-breath, out-breath, observation of breath. That was that was his main practice. And so Umandala encourages this guy to, as he's sweeping in the morning, just to like notice his breath you know, really casually, not any kind of like practice. Now do this, do it for this amount of time, you know, do it, you know, maintain this level of awareness, just like, you know, as you're sweeping, just kind of, kind of notice that you have a breath. And so he's waking up in the morning. There's no internet. There's no um, distraction. There's no public place he can go, um, to, to, to do something. And he, um, um, all he can do is wake up and, and, and sweep, uh, a pretty empty, empty place and, um, and observe his breath. And so he starts doing that and, you know, they're talking a little bit more and eventually it moves into, you know, at some point he's sitting for a minute at a time, 
you know, I, I don't know when, I don't know what time of the day, but he's just sitting for one minute, just one minute, just trying it. Maybe at lunch, they stop eating lunch, close your eyes, open your eyes, whatever. And they're just observing the breath. Um, and then towards the end, just kind of speeding up the process of, of these meditative instructions. I, I think he might've been sitting for as long as an hour at some points. So I'm, I'm not sure of that, but it was very casual. So it wasn't like, you know, this is a sitting, wow. you have to sit here. This is the way you have to behave. But I think just naturally it went into this hour of, um, of meditative practice. And, uh, you know, Umandala was with him every step. They, they, he was a shadow. They, they were together at every moment. They talked constantly. They ate together. Um, I, I know there wasn't much on his Facebook feed, but one of the things that really struck me was at one point Umandala, Umandala's uh, workers had to go to the nearby town of Schwebo about an hour and a half away to get some supplies. And he begged to come. I mean, he was just so bored and just wanted distraction. And on his Facebook feed, he described the trip and took pictures. And he had this line that says, I saw, I saw the advertisements for alcohol and they were laughing at me. You know, just um, they were... Um, you know, as he was coming away from this addiction, I think we could all identify that with whatever our addictive um, objects are. And uh, I also saw, you know, he's a kind of expat businessman operating in Southeast Asia. And as he was sharing episodes from his time at the monastery and very, very simple posts, very kind of beautiful of just like, I woke up and I did this and the villagers did this. And, you know, this is where we went. I, I'm seeing these expat friends of like Bangkok and Philippines and uh, Vietnam kind of, um, you know, single older expat guys. You can all kind of imagine the stereotype of that and the kind of that kind of life just um, writing on his Facebook posts like, who are you? You know, what are you doing? You know, the one of their own going to a place like this. And uh, and so this is his um, this is his experience being there. Let, let me pause there. There's uh, some some of the story to wrap up when I met him again, but that's 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 quite a mouthful of kind of sharing this process of a meditative experience he went through. And just uh, I, I don't know how much of this Zach you knew or remembered, but but just checking in with you, your your thought your thoughts on uh, on hearing that. No, I, I think I'm just uh, yeah. I want to I want to hear how it ends. <laughs> I mean, I, I I know how it ends, but like in, I'm actually in the story again, and just like yeah, I want to hear how it how it goes. Okay, okay. So I did see him again um, once or twice beyond that, and I I mean he was he 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 was bright when I saw him. He was he was just calm. I mean he was cool. He was relaxed. He wasn't. He wasn't nervous or sh- I mean, he was shaking too. That was another thing. He was he was physically shaking before, and he wasn't shaking, and he wasn't wasn't um, agitated, like kind of eyes darting around frantically everywhere, like he was before. He was just polite and pleasant and easygoing, and um, you know he uh, he was saying, you know, I I want to. Co- I told Umandala I want to come here every year. You know, once a year I want to come back. And just be there because I, I didn't know that was possible. I just, I didn't know that I can get away like that. And one of the, the things that, that really struck me and filled me with a sense of, uh, of gratitude and, um, and just good feeling was that even at the moment, I remember thinking, I don't know how the story is going to end. Um, I don't know what more inner demons he has to battle and what conditions will appear, I don't know how far this will go, but what I do know is that this gave him an option that he didn't know was possible before. This showed him that when your world is collapsing and you're falling headfirst into your addictions, that you don't have to, that that there is another option. And that option is, is on upon a meditation. That option is a good friend who is going to encourage your better qualities and give good advice or guidance. That option is simplicity. That was a big thing for him. Just the fact that he could go somewhere where there was nothing and, and calm, just be calm with not many opportunities or distractions. And he now had an, a sense of the possibility of moving forward that he didn't have before. So whatever decisions he could make in the future, depending on his, his, uh, you know, his karma and his conditions and the conditions he found himself and everything else, he at least knew that there was an option for relief and for not falling deeper that he didn't know before. He literally didn't know that that option was on the table and he knew that now and he knew what you can do and how you could do it 
and what benefit that brought and how it just kind of paused things and allowed you to get back, kind of get back in check. And, um, and that just felt wonderful. It just felt wonderful that, that we had played some small part in helping him to see that he had that potential to make other decisions, what decisions he made, you know, that's beyond our control. I do know that he, for months, um, months and months and months after that, he was in touch with Umandala every day, every day. He was calling him, Umandala, you know, back and forth. Both were calling each other. They were texting, they were talking. I mean, just a really, you know, just this, uh, this cosmopolitan European business traveler in Southeast Asia and this, um, you know, rural monk who had ordained when he was 17 years old, only because it was the the 50th anniversary of the founding of Webu's monastery. He ordained under Webu. And these two form this really special bond and love and care with each other. And you you just would talk, you'd say Umandala's name and you'd see this guy, his face would just melt. I mean, he just, he, he, he was just cared for. So he just taken in, you know, is that, that, that steel form that Umandala had, had shared with me on the phone, you know, is this is not, this is not him. This is clouds obscuring the heart and I will take responsibility. He, that hardness. And, and the one insistence, you know, he cannot touch alcohol, everything else, leave it to me, uh, leave it to Dhamma, really. But um, that that hard resolve combined with the soft care and touch of of just just so slowly and gradually and patiently bringing him through this this regimen of Sheila and concentration and you know love lo- love of someone that that is is caring about you and guiding you and spending time and um taking your mental space to to check in with you and um to to bring him to to that point and so that that was a really uh that was really beautiful to go through and i know that i'm in touch with the guests periodically and i do know that he's still and i'm in touch with Amanda more and i know that they're still in touch i don't know if he's gone back but i know that not too long passes where they're not still in touch with each other and and that's wonderful um it's also to to kind of give a little bit of my summary of the story or my moral, one of the things that I like about it quite a bit is that, you know, when you talk about foreigners coming to Myanmar, coming for, for Dhamma practice, you know, meditators, it's usually really clean, good, inspiring stories of like, you know, someone finding a cave and, you know, going there and meditating this long and following this kind of uh, rigorous practice and, um, you know, getting this kind of support from villagers. In, in other words, it's it's very upright people acting in very upright ways and you know, giving back in ways that fill your heart and receiving things that also fill your heart and just wonderful, inspiring kind of stories of good cheer all the way around. And this is the one story that I've been involved with that really stands out of someone coming with no meditative background, no understanding of any sort of Buddhist practice or or methodology or even ethics and on his last legs and, you know, in his own words, and not behaving appropriately, not making good decisions, you know, really the opposite of that, really behaving outrageously and inappropriately. And and so this Dhamma is not just for those who've made a radical transformation in their life and have kind of figured some things out and are going to higher stages of purification, like many of the people we probably have on the podcast, many of those those guests who you know have have enormously um, inspirational lives that that were which is one of the reasons we're talking to them. But this is also a place where people that are going through these immense inner struggles and not really coming out the other end in a successful way that are tottering off the edge that it is also for them. And sometimes when a Westerner thinks about the possibility of ordaining as a monastic, um, a monk or a nun temporarily or longer, it's the sense of like, well, I have to be pure enough or I have to be dedicated enough. Or, you know, if I come to Burma or if I take a pilgrimage or if I take an extended meditation retreat, just kind of all these, these, um, these wishes and these, these volitions that there's a sense, there's a kind of an inner judgment of, you know, how, uh, what level you have to be at to, uh, to qualify in a sense. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, self-hate and, um, and, uh, self-criticism that we Westerners face. And to me, this is such a wonderful story because this is someone who is really struggling and there's a place for him. There's a place for him and his impurities and his struggles to come into and to gain that relief and that understanding of Dhamma. 
And this is for everyone, you know, and as we heard in Thabawa's uh, podcast, where he looks around and notices that the meditation centers that exist today, they're not for people with mental, severe mental or physical disabilities. And he doesn't like that. He wants to be able to, to meet more people. And this is a story of this guest of being someone who's outside those margins of someone who can qualify for a traditional retreat because of his struggles. And yet there is still a place for him. There is still... Uh, a Dhamma teaching that can come and embrace him and transform him. And um, that part of the story and that uniqueness is what makes it really stand out as one of my most precious memories and the first story that I wanted to share on this uh, on this podcast. Yeah, it's uh, for all those reasons, it's, it is such a great story. Uh, one aspect that comes to mind is just how, how like a, uh, institutionalized kind of one size fits all kind of technique is 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 one thing that's available in the world uh when you come to a place like Myanmar, we talked about this before this kind of uh, buffet of offerings in dhamma um, and some of them organized and more institutional or or uh, and some more like you just never know kind of like what can arise for you like there's th there's so much variety of of how it can manifest. Uh, and I think that's not necessarily what you would get in other places. In a place like Myanmar, yeah, there's a place for, for him. You know, it, it may not be, like I said, something we can look up and, and, and on the web and find a description for it and, and put him in a program. It's just like, it's just someone we happen to know with the perfect disposition. Because a big part of that story is the skillfulness with which Umandala handled him. I mean, so gentle and so loving, but just start with sweeping. <laughs> just, just simplify your life for a while, you know, and then just pay attention to the, you know, just really gradual, you know, no hurry, not trying to achieve anything, just, just, and let the effects of it be felt, you know, not told, you know, and, and uh, yeah, like I said, he may have had good luck if he came across the right people in, in a, in a more institutionalized uh, meditation center, but um yeah, there's so so that's one side of it. Just this, uh, all the possibilities. Just because there is so much dhamma in in Myanmar. Yeah, I think that's that's really right, and that's that's also you know what what you're saying is getting at also one of the reasons why we wanted to put together this podcast and some of the stories that we want to tell, the diversity of experience that's out there, the 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 kind of stories that go off the mainstream um this is definitely one of those off the mainstream and that really gives encouragement <laughs> that no matter where you're at and what your level of experience is and what difficulty you're facing that if you do come to this place and you throw yourself into it and i've seen a lot of people throw themselves into it none more dramatic than this example that you can find a landing spot that might not give you what you expect but you know can give you what you need at the moment who who would have ever guessed that someone of his um what would you call it lifestyle or situation would end up in engine bin you know uh, if you ever been mm -hmm. there it's like you know dirt roads and and ox pulled uh wagon carts and you know and and uh he would have never ended up there just within the um the um you know the the normal uh, routine of his of of his life, and I mean it, that shows up in the responses from his friends, right? Like his mm. like his his group, his posse that he normally hangs out with. They're like, "What are you doing? <laughs> Where are you? Mm. I, how would mm. you? I mean, that place is it, nor even that whole region wouldn't even be on the map for these guys in their life. That's not in their, uh, you know." in their routine, you know, so, uh, but, you know, I like it also, this gentleman, you know, there's two sides to this, right? There's, there's some kind of inner calling, you know, he did take the, his very first step was just to sign up, sign up for Airbnb with you guys. And so there is this, and, and then, so the other side of that, so I just wanted to, you know, give him this also, make sure you give him this credit for, for actually taking those steps. Uh, even while falling down, you know, it's still, I mean, I mean, how else do you start? I mean, what, a, what, what strength the, you know, courage he had, you know, it could see, you could say it's, well, it's weak. He's not able to, 
man, if you've ever been deep in addiction, it's, it's so difficult to, to take those steps in the middle of all that is just a very courageous thing. Um, the other side is just like that, that monasticism, Buddhism, I, I think it's more just Buddhism in general, but I think Buddhist monks do uh, have a, a reputation I mean, I shouldn't say anything that I, I think that's probably true, but for him at least, coming from a completely different culture, he had this idea that maybe, maybe that, what would you call it? But maybe Buddhism in this way could help him. And so there's a reputation of, 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 of the practice and, and the whole thing. I mean, to use the word religion isn't quite right, but I think you know what I mean. That phenomenon of Buddhism is has a reputation such as someone even coming from another culture when they're on their last legs that, hey, maybe, maybe this could help me. And I, I, I you know, that, that harkens back to Usarna's uh, uh, talking about the behavior of monks and touching money and stuff and how... Over 2,500 years, it hasn't been perfect. And there's, there's actually a lot of uh, frustrating things that have happened that aren't very inspiring in the monastic order. But overall, I still think it, I mean, this is kind of miraculous that after 2,500 years, it hasn't denigrated to a point where, you know, it, it's not something that's inspiring. It is still inspiring to people. It's still encouraging to people. It's still inviting to people. <laughs> and, and and then you never know where you're going to end up so it comes in and ends up getting like landing an engine bin of all places i i mean i think that part's kind of funny but like it's also a very beautiful thing uh, and but a very uh, from the side of practitioners and monastics you know the, there is a responsibility of um of being authentic you know not not just pretending to be something good but actually being authentically uh, involved in something very wholesome, you know, and I, I, I think by and large, that is still enough of the case where the needle tips in people's minds that, that there's this uh, even from, like I said, even from other cultures, there's a, there's a there's a good reputation there that that attracted this man. Yeah, yeah, right. And for me, it was um, another learning experience with me and just in my own evolution and growth is that I think when I first got into meditation and it very much became an identity of, you know, I was of a passionate meditator and these are the codes I want to live by and this is how I want my behavior to be transformed and my interests. And, you know, it was really, really quite a, a dramatic transformation to go through. And it was painful as well to figure out how I was still me, but how I was also um, going to incorporate this practice into the new me. And one of the the more painful, clumsy ways it got incorporated was in dividing the world between, you know, meditators and non-meditators or meditators and serious meditators and um, making these kind of divisions among people so that, you know, I would want to interact with people that were putting more of a premium and priority on the practice. And being in, Mer being in Myanmar is just a great opportunity to come out of this um, and to see all the different levels and gradations. And so for me, it was um, seeing someone of his struggles being able to benefit and interact and commit to this kind of training really helped to blur those lines and show the really the unimportance of those lines of who's a meditator and who's not and and who am I you know I, I want to call this person a serious meditator and I want to associate with people of this category and then just seeing more people as people and and those um, labels break down uh, it also reminds me of uh, you know years before that there was another very very short anecdote um, just a short conversation that really affected me where I was staying in the Sagain Hills for about half a year. I was living in a cave there and uh, practicing quite a bit every day and got to know a lot of the villagers around. And there was one family who lived nearby that had a son in his like 20s or 30s or something. And he was kind of known as the town loser, just kind of didn't amount to anything and had an alcohol problem and couldn't really hold down a job. And um, I, I always liked the guy. Like I had some really nice conversations with him, found him kind of gentle. Um, but I also saw that, you know, his life wasn't really all, all the way together and at one point he said oh you know next water festival i'm going to ordain as a monk for 10 days and i said oh yeah that's great and uh he said yeah you know 10 days like that those 10 days will be 
I will have absolute purity in my conduct. It'll be stainless. And it's just, I'll be able to hold on to those 10 days as something really precious where I know that I can't violate anything. He said, I can't do more than those 10 days. I, I can't go any longer, but I know I can do those 10 days. And that was like one of the most inspiring things I ever heard in a country of Dhamma and 10 years of being here. Like a, a drunk loser who can't hold down a job, who has an alcohol problem, who's going to ordain 10 days as a monk, and that's all he can do. That is one of the most inspiring quotes I heard here. And the reason why is that even someone at his station with his struggles recognizes that for 10 days, he will have joyful living by following ethics. And that was just astounding to me um, from the country I come from, um, that that level of wisdom would be there. And, yeah, you know, of course, it'd be wonderful if he could manage more than 10 days. And, um, you know, of course, you wish for that. Maybe he has by now. But um, just the fact that that he saw a sense of uh, of accomplishment, of living that pure lifestyle for whatever period of time he could manage, for whatever commitment he wanted to give to the Dhamma, that he would get a return on that. And um, and so like these kind of anecdotes and stories just kind, you know, help you to take these labels off, which really aren't helpful of dividing the world and, um, you know, of assessment and judgment according to, you know, your own belief of someone's um, effort and commitment to the Dhamma. I don't, I don't even know how to respond to that. It's such mm. a... Uh, it's touching. It's 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 really profound. It's like okay, the first noble truth is there is suffering, but there is also you know, if there if there wasn't a way out of suffering, then then something like drinking becomes makes more sense because when you see the suffering, people need relief and whether that's less unhealthy or more unhealthy but you understand the drive for relief but that there exists in the world also something that can give people some true relief and then if they keep going even more but at any what you what i hear you talking about is it at any level it can be so profound right so 10 days of purity just it gives them you know for someone who probably is not only has the village kind of, you know, like haranguing him for, you know, what he isn't isn't doing, he probably does it internally as well. But it gives him like 10 days of um, something to be proud of. But also, not just because he accomplished some goal. I mean, there's that too, but that he also got an insight into, even if he's not ready for it, something wholesome he knows it exists and he participated in it he 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 didn't just read about it he, he took a drink so to speak you know from that that spring um and it's rare you know and i i think that's what's uh it's just such a it's almost like a miracle that there's something other than this giant river that just flows in one direction just roiling in loba dosa and moha you know um craving aversion and delusion it just seems to continually feed upon itself and, and generate more of just that the fact that there is anything else and the fact that people like this gentleman that stayed with you or this this uh town loser as you as you you painted the picture you know that 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 for anyone there's a a a place to rest and uh, even if you rest there long enough you can actually engage it and and come out of that river altogether. I mean, that's a that's that's almost like a miracle that that even exists. In it's like a it's almost like a loophole, and, and that's funny to to think of loophole because we we're talking about loops, and I'm talking about things re regenerating itself. Loba dosa moha regenerating itself, regenerating itself. So we talked about this gentleman staying with you, being stuck in these loops, even though he's got a glimpse of something else, a glimpse of understanding, a glimpse of honesty, keeps looping back, looping back. Um, he probably uh, There's bigger loops too. Even after Injun Bin, he probably, at least to some degree, looped back. But every little bit of truth that you encounter on the loop 
uh, that bit of peace you encountered in the loop, those little inter interjections. Most of the loop's not like that, right? But the engine bin was was part of that loop. You know, even though most of it's coming back, coming back to the the behaviors you stuck in. In that loop, he got a glimpse of something else. In that loop, the ten days for the other guy got a glimpse of something else. Um, but to call it a loop hole, you know, it's interesting, right? Because you loop around, loop around. That's what life is. Keep looping around, stuck in these habit patterns based on loba, dosa, and moha. And the loop hole can actually, can take you all the way out of the loop. So, sorry, I, that's an insight. So I'm kind of like uh, excited about it. Like just to call it a loophole, you know, because uh, the loop is the world, is uh, samsara. And that there's a loophole in the, in the loop is, uh, yeah. I, I, and I'm glad that it doesn't just take one caliber of person to get there. That 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 its existence can be touched by anyone. Yeah. And so that's what this story of the, of your visitor uh, represents. Right. Exactly. That that these opportunities are are open for for everyone, and that when. Uh, the Dhamma has been exported and and delivered in foreign places, so there's less of this kind of opportunity. It's more like you have to fit yourself inside whatever the teaching or the teacher is just by virtue of not having as many options. But in a place as rich and fertile and varied as Myanmar, there's just so many ways to engage based on what you're looking for and who you are and and where you're at at life. And that the thing I liked about the story about this this kind of town drunk was that all he was able to give at this time in his life was 10 days of purity as a monk. Like that was the only thing he can give. That was the most he can renounce. And he was, you know, self-conscious. He was self-conscious about it. He was self-referential. Like he, he realized that's what he was doing. He was explaining to me, these are the 10 days that I'm giving. This is all I can renounce. And I get so much pleasure from it. And, um, and that's great. And in, in other kind of countries, you don't really get to engage at the level that you're able to. You need to adapt yourself. And it also reminds me, if we go back to Injin Bin, there, there's this other story I'd like to juxtapose where I had, in one of the pilgrimages I, I, I had led, uh, we went to Injin Bin and there was one meditator from Australia who was really touched and moved by being there. He's a meditator, um, uh, many years of meditation experience, uh, really, um, really committed to the practice and something in Injin Bin, it really affected him deeply. And when he went back home, he spoke to a teacher in his tradition and, and just mentioned his idea that he wanted to go back to Injin Bin and live there indefinitely, you know, maybe for, for several months, maybe for a year and just kind of be around Umandala and soak up the vibes and, um, you know, meditate and maybe learn Burmese and hang out with the, the, the locals and just kind of grow in this way. And he spoke to a teacher that was very, very experienced, you know, many probably 40 years or so of meditation and teaching. And the teacher actually cautioned him away from this and said, oh, you know, this is a very strong place and, you know, you have to be very high level and things could happen you don't understand. And, you know, you have to have to kind of pass through some other stages and and commitments and developments before you could really do that. And so he was talked out of it. He I heard about the story many years later um, and he he had some regret that he had never acted on, on this moment where he wanted to do that as it was, he ended up getting married and getting, um, kind of tied down with job and responsibility and that door closed. And he always felt this sense of regret that he had never had that opportunity before. And I, I mean, when I heard that story, I was so upset. I was, I just felt so, so sorry for him and, you know, really kind of angered at the advice that he was given that, that, um, that he was turned away kind of. And, but this story as a juxtaposition is really fascinating because here you have, you know, a committed meditator who spent, you know, completely transformed and redesigned his life to fit into um, being able to meditate and observe the principles and the practice and the ethics of meditation. And he's being told he's not advanced enough to be able to go and follow his dreams by by living here. And then you have a, a, a falling on his face alcoholic with no Buddhist background who goes and stays and is able to derive that benefit. And I think this, this juxtaposition kind of tells us a different way of thinking about the practice of Burma and other countries. Yeah, you know, it's just sad, you know, and it, but it goes back to something I think time and time again, I just see more and more um, support for this idea that we have to, at some point, uh, come out of other people being responsible for our practice. 
we have to make our own decisions, even if they're not perfect, you know, um, that we have, we should listen to other people. I think we should take in stuff, but ultimately I think we have to have our own discernment. We have to even make mistakes. So what if, what if he did go there and what if it was too intense? What, what might he learn about it? Like from experience rather than just from some authority telling him like what's what, what the rules are, you know, but I mean, I don't really want to get into the absurdity of that. Like, who is someone else from somewhere else to say what the rules of engine bin are and who qualifies to, to meet <laughs> them? I mean, this right. is, it's just absurd. Mm -hmm. But even if he's right, how do you actually encourage someone to, to have experiences that would teach them that? Because if it's not, it just becomes a belief. And that's just like becomes more like religious. You know, you, you believe these things that are heard, but you don't really know that. You don't, you know, like, how do you t touch these things and, and to find out where the boundaries are yourself? You know, and so, so on the one hand, he, he misses out on engine bin and the other, and, and another thing he misses out on is just his own ability to follow his enthusiasm in Dhamma, uh, which I think is important. And, and that kind of, Dhamma adolescence, where you do pursue what you're interested in and you learn discernment along the way and, and grow in that kind of wisdom. I think it's essential. So, uh, but I don't want to go off too much on that tangent about, you know, the juxtaposed, you know, um, but all, all the more, <laughs> I you're right, there's perhaps more of that in the West. That's just another benefit to Myanmar. They, you know, the, Dhamma's for everyone. You know, and if a place is too intense, you feel it and then you 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 still might benefit from. So what what if this guy went there and he couldn't handle it for six months or or kind of indefinite? Right there. there he benefited, but there came a limit. Right. I'm sure he would benefit because he was so enthused about being there and he'd already been there. He had already been there. Right. Yes. And he was very moved by the experience. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so he already had benefit there from that place. That's his wisdom. That's his experience. And you wanted to go back there. Maybe he would learn that like the the benefit is from that moment and you can't go back and rechase things. And maybe it wouldn't have been so beneficial the second time, but that would be another. It doesn't really matter what happens when he goes. Whatever he experiences, he, he can learn from. And so, yeah, I it's. I don't want to get into how sad I feel about that, but but just how, uh, you know, how amazing, uh, when that kind of attitude is removed, how amazing the opportunities are. And and Myanmar, not that Myanmar doesn't have its own issues, but that's not one of them. You know, this freedom to go and taste and engage in all kinds of possibilities and in all kinds of levels and ways to enter in the Dhamma for anyone at any level of interest, even if it's one person, one morning, offering some rice to monks. It could be that simple. I mean, it could be just going to just to visit a temple, I mean, or a monastery. I mean, there's so many ways to engage. And they all have a profound effect. They're all subjectively effective for the person, wherever they're at. Right, right. And as I hear you say that, one thing that comes to mind is this idea of gatekeeper. And gatekeeper has somewhat of a negative connotation, and there's certainly that involved in it. But, you know, to flesh it out in fuller context and to be more fair, these are kind of messengers and teachers and guides that have benefited from Dhamma practice and are then sharing it in their native countries, which is, you know, that part is is really wonderful. A lot of seeds were planted by um these uh, these people that were these now teachers that were profoundly affected themselves and are now sharing it with a younger community. So that's a really, you know, I want to give fair due to um, the, the positive part of this and the role they play. But then that that kind of guide teacher can become something of a gatekeeper and something of a, um, you know, rule setting and evaluating and assessing and, and some degree of students giving up a measure of freedom for, um, you know, for that guidance and instruction. And, um, and I think again, that like you, I don't want to go too, too much into the, the negative part of it. I want to look at the, the opposite of the contrast of Myanmar. And again, not like Myanmar is the perfect country or the perfect, um, Buddhist practice. They definitely got into some, um, concerns and 
in, in other areas and podcasts and talks. But yet, even with that, you can live this life here. You can come here and make your own decisions, have your own freedom of thought and practice, um, go where and engage at the level that you're looking for, the depth or the shallowness or the breadth or, or whatever it is you want. And you, um, you can still incorporate these guides and teachers and instructors, and you could even submit to, to their, their wisdom and really follow through and, and, um, and, and, and learn under them. And yet at the same, same time, this can be done without gatekeepers. This can be an independent, uh, decision of one's own agency to decide, um, how and what it is they want to do. And when you come to a country like Myanmar and you come with a sense that you don't have a gatekeeper that is, is deciding where you go and how you do it, that you are able to find your own path. And that is something that, well, everywhere in life, you hope that one is making their own choices. That's, that's, that's obviously a, a good practice to do, but you can't necessarily make your own Dhamma choices to the extent in a country where there's not as much offering. So to be able to come in a place like this, where it is so rich and fertile of the opportunities available, the buffet table, as we just talked about in a recent podcast, um, that, uh, you don't have, you could bypass these gatekeepers and make and live with your own decisions as we see in some of these examples. Well, you can still get, I mean, for your guests, I mean, it's it's not black and white. It's not gatekeeper or you're all on your own, right? So, right, so right. the what's happening here in Myanmar isn't the opposite of gatekeeper. It's like they just the people that are playing a gatekeeper role are playing a different role of just encouragement, enthusiasm, and, and passing on. You know, I mean, he had uh, your guest had Umandala there, so he wasn't just winging it. You know, um, the there's still people, uh, it, the role that can be played by people that are, are perhaps more experienced and, and, and encouraging and guiding you don't have to play a role of gatekeeper. Um, I, think right. there's a, well I think there's a time and a place for it. You know, there's, there's a skill in gatekeeping. I think when someone, you know, just like if you're sure someone's going to really harm themselves, you know, then uh, really harmful. I mean, a kid touching fire is not going to kill them, you know, just touching it. If they fall into it, it's a whole other thing, right? But like, you know, uh, just touching it to know that it can burn your finger, you know, they're not, that, that might be good for them, you know, and, and to just have some, s some spectrum of like, you know, like I'm only going to jump in like a parent, you know, kind of forbidding something, you know, um, when it's at this degree, you know, maybe, and maybe that, person acting as a gatekeeper thought that was the case you know but i don't know I, I i can't go too far into that i i i think there is something absurd about that um but i i do have a feeling that that gatekeeper actually really probably did see it that way but but uh i you, you can't play a gatekeeper role in someone's life in dhamma life indefinitely at at someday you know hopefully that person themselves becomes uh, wise enough to 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 also be able to share with other people and perhaps guide other people. So they have, you know, they may play a gatekeeper role someday. They how are they going to gain that wisdom? You know, like um, you you can't maintain that parent child relationship forever. Yeah, right. Well, boy, it's all it's all really great stuff. Were, were there any other last thoughts you wanted to share before we close down? No, I think that feels good. I just appreciate you telling the story and, and sharing it. Uh, I had actually forgotten about it. Um, I, what the reference was as soon as as soon as you were about ten minutes in, I'm like, oh yeah, 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 I know what he's talking about. Like, but at first, when you talk, when you said you know the engine bin story, I, I was like, not sure. If you had said Airbnb guest, perhaps <laughs> I would have. But yeah. Anyways, yeah, I, 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 it was enjoyable to go through that again. You know, and hope it was enjoyable for our listeners as well. Yeah, just kind of exploring and being a little playful with the formats that we do and realize that we had some some stories we wanted to get out there and, and take more time than just a few minutes. So we'll see how this is received. Definitely encourage listeners to to share your comments and feedback and let us know what, what you think and what you want more of. And 
next time around on these uh, Myanmar Dhamma Diaries, we'll we'll hear a story from Zach. I, I know he has some some good ones that will uh, will entertain and inspire and inform as well. Yeah, great. Be happy to share. Great. Okay. Well, let's close it here and uh, and thanks so much for uh, for for playing listener and questioner and examiner with me on this. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. One of the beautiful things about Burmese monasteries is that everyone can practice selfless giving. I've seen poor families give just one spoonful of rice to a communal alms bowl, and I've seen still poorer families wake up at five in the morning to collect flowers to offer to the Buddha shrine. As our Insight Myanmar podcast runs on the power of donation, we also greatly appreciate any amount of support to keep our engine running. If you'd like to give a monthly donation through Patreon, That continued support will allow us to continue making these episodes available to you. If even a small fraction of our listeners donated the equivalent of a cup of coffee as a monthly pledge, we could be funded well into the future. If your income is less stable, we greatly appreciate one-time donations as well of any amount. If you find the Dhamma interviews we are sharing of value and would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give via Patreon at www.patreon.com dot com slash insight Myanmar as well as PayPal at www.paypal.me slash insight Myanmar. In both cases, that's insight Myanmar one word, I N S I G H T M Y A N M A R. If you are in Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to get in touch with us. You have been listening to the Insight Myanmar podcast. We invite you to rate, review, and share our podcast as every little bit of feedback helps. You can also subscribe to the Insight Myanmar podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also make sure to check out our website for our complete episodes, including additional text, videos, and other information at www.insightmyanmar.org. That's one word, I-N-S-I-G-H-T, M-Y-A-N-M-A-R dot O-R-G. If you cannot find our feed on your podcast player, please let us know and we will ensure that it could be offered there in the future. There was certainly a lot to talk about in this episode and we'd like to encourage listeners to keep the discussion going. Make a post, suggest a guest, request specific questions, and join in on discussions on our Insight Myanmar podcast Facebook group. And also welcome to join our Facebook and Instagram accounts by the same name of... Inside Myanmar. If you're not on Facebook, you can also message us directly at burmadama at gmail.com. That's B U R M A D H A M M A at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to start up a discussion group on another platform, let us know and we can share that forum. We would also like to take this time to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, especially our two sound engineers, Martin Combs and Tharng A, along with Zach Hessler content collaborator and part-time co-host. Ken Pransky helps with editing, Kishing Bat Gamble does our social media templates, and Dragos Bandita and André Francois make our sketches. We'd also like to thank everyone who has assisted us bringing the guests who have made up the show thus far, as well as the guests themselves for agreeing to come and share. Finally, we are immensely grateful for the donors who made this entire thing possible. We also remind our listeners that the opinions expressed by our guests are their own and not necessarily reflective of the host or other podcast contributors. If you find the Dhamma interviews we are sharing of value and would like to support our mission, we welcome your contribution. You may give monthly donations at Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Insight Myanmar or one-time donations on PayPal at www.paypal.me slash Insight Myanmar. In both cases, that's Insight Myanmar, one word. If you are in Myanmar and would like to give a cash donation, please feel free to get in touch with us. Mm